um, unknowingly, and uh, it was about the worst thing I've ever put in my mouth by my big brother. Um, and Swindoll says, contrary to what we might expect, this guy was not starving, nor was he being initiated into a fraternity or a, having a trick played by Brian Schulenberg's brother. Rather, it happened at an elegant physician's home near Miami. The dog food was served on delicate little crackers with a wedge of imported cheese, bacon bits, and olive, and topped with a sliver of pimento, or d'oeuvres a la Alpo. Ugh. The deed was not perpetrated by an enemy, but by a friend. <laughs> Talk about friends like that. Who needs enemies, right? Okay. He says she had just graduated from a gourmet cooking course and decided that she would put her skills to the ultimate test. And did she ever? After doctoring up those miserable morsels, she placed them on a silver tray. And with a sly grin, she watched them disappear. Swindoll's friend couldn't get enough. He kept coming back for more. And evidently, he writes, the women's friends were a pretty laid-back group because everyone in the group had a good laugh when she told them what they'd been eating, to each their own. That is a perfect illustration, Hughes writes, of what goes on in another realm, namely religious deception. Everyday Christians, everyday professional Christians, phony preachers are marketing their wares on shiny platters, decorated in such a way that people don't know what they are really getting. Their dishes are topped with the language of orthodoxy, pious religious cliches and buzzwords, and are eagerly consumed by the tragically grateful. They even pay for it by the millions, and that should never happen, and certainly the Lord doesn't want it to happen. That is why, as he proceeds with the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, he gives advice to those who do not want to be led astray. The lengthy, driving conclusion which began in verses 13 and 14 with the Lord's urging us to enter the narrow gate and to take the narrow road as the sermon has prescribed. Now in verse 15, it is, it is as if we can see the Lord Jesus standing by the fork that separates the narrow and broad way and saying as our text records, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Have you ever seen wolves? I love going to the, to the zoo and looking at wolves. They are majestic animals. They are strong and physical and they're, they're mighty. They travel in packs. They are incredibly smart animals and they love meat. And in the days in which Jesus lived, they were known as the natural enemy of all sheep. Shepherds who inhabited the hills of Israel knew much about these predatory animals. And while attacks on human beings by wolves are rare, in fact, only one person in the history of North America has been killed by a pack of wolves, it remains very common for a wolf or a pack of wolves to make their way into a sheep pen and to devour many of the sheep in that flock. You know, over and over again in Scripture, Jesus referred to himself as a shepherd. In fact, in John chapter 10, verse 11, he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And if you're a Christian today, then one of many ways that Jesus Christ views you is as a sheep in his pasture. In fact, it's something that isn't just even a New Testament truth. In the Old Testament, the psalmist David in Psalm 100 verse 3 said, Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. As a protective shepherd, Jesus wants us to be aware of the fact that there will be many false prophets and teachers who will invade his church, seeking to deceive the bride of Christ. In teaching about the risk of deception in the church, Jesus showed the true character of these false teachers in John chapter 7, verse 15. Again, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. You know, this wouldn't be the only time that Jesus would address the issue of false teachers with his disciples. In fact, in Matthew chapter 24, it's this fantastic passage in Scripture where Jesus begins to teach those who are gathered around him what it will look like in the time before he returns for his church. And in Matthew 24, verses 10 and 11, when speaking about the end times, Jesus said this, At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. There is no question that before Jesus returns, apostasy or false teaching will increase, and it will increase in the church. And one of the sad th truths is that many who call themselves believers of Jesus Christ today, 
people who teach Sunday school classes, people who stand behind pulpits, people who lead small groups, people who are at Christian schools, people who, you know, you name it, are going to be people who will be led astray by false doctrine. John MacArthur has written a book that I want to recommend that all of you pick up. It is so good. I took some time to read it this week. It's called uh, The Truth War, Fighting for Certainty in an Age of Deception. The book was published in 2007. It's been sitting on my desk for six years, so it's or five years or whatever. So it's taken me a while to read the book. All right, I don't expect you to read it this week, but it is a phenomenal book. And what is so phenomenal about it is that considering the time in which it was written and some of the people that were interviewed in the book, the book has become almost prophetic in the sense of what MacArthur said would happen in some of these churches. In his introduction to the book, he quotes many of the leaders of the emerging church movement, which was um, growing so rapidly at the beginning of this century. Some of the leaders in that movement were just beginning their walk away from Orthodox Christianity when the book was written. In the past few months, some of those in the book have taken large steps away from Orthodox Christianity, either writing books or preaching sermons in which they deny true uh, doctrine that Scripture teaches. And they have moved so far away from what the Bible teaches that their teaching when placed next to the truth of God's Word is almost, um, it's just shocking how far, how far they've gone. Doctrines like heaven and hell, salvation by faith through grace alone in Jesus Christ, the existence of Satan, the God of creation, the sanctity of marriage, and the sanctity of life have been stripped away from their theology. Many of these teachers of Christian churches are now teaching that all roads essentially lead to heaven and have adopted a universalism in their approach. The sad truth is that many of the books and the videos that these teachers put out are at the top of the bestseller list in our Christian bookstores today. Many of the churches that these men or women preach are some of the largest churches in our nation. And it reminds me of something that the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, that young pastor that he was mentoring in 2 Timothy 4.3. This is the last book that Paul would write. It is uh, one of the last things that he would say. In 2 Timothy 4, 3, Paul wrote, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers who say what their itching ears want to hear. And if ever there was a description of our generation, this is a really, really good one. When I was in college, the pastor of my home church preached a message on this passage. I'll never forget He entitled the passage, Ministry in an Age of Itching Ears. I still have the cassette tape somewhere at my house. I purchased it because it made an impact on my life. Perhaps it was because I had felt God's call to ministry and I was studying to become a pastor. But those words spoke so much to me because pastors are called by God to preach the entire message of the Word of God, not just those parts that are easy to hear, not just those parts that culture likes, not just the parts that aren't controversial. You know, Martin Luther, that great reformer, knew a little bit about preaching a controversial truth. The great reformer once wrote about the conviction that undergirded his passion. And I'm going to read you a, a, a quote, and if, if, if you're kind of dozing here, listen to this one, okay? And, and stay, stay in tune here, all right, for this paragraph. If I profess with the loudest voice, Luther said, in the clearest exposition, every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at the moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christ. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on the battlefield, on all the battlefield besides, is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. It is the duty of a pastor, but not just a pastor, but is it a duty of the church to stand up for truth when truth is debated on the public square? And Luther said, it is, it, is, it is my responsibility as one who handles the word of God to make sure that I don't shy away from standing up for the truth of Scripture. We need to guard ourselves against preachers and teachers who only want to preach that which will not be offensive. In speaking about the religious leaders of his day in Matthew 15, 9, Jesus said this, they worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. They weren't teaching at all. 
what God wanted taught. You know, the Apostle Paul modeled much of his ministry after Jesus. He was the ultimate church planter. He, he planted probably dozens of churches in his day and age all over the ancient Near East world. Some of those churches were planted in as short of a time as a week. He would come in and new believers would follow him and he'd continue to mentor the leaders of those churches from afar. Some of those churches he would spend up to three years with. As he planted churches in the ancient Near East, Paul saw it as part of his duty as a shepherd, to, to, as a pastor, to shepherd the flock that God had given him. And part of that shepherding involved warning young churches and young Christians about false teachers. Listen to what he said to the church at Galatia in Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I am astonished, he said, that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one that we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so I now say it again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you have accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Do you think Paul was serious about this? He says, listen, even if an angel comes down from heaven and appears in the pulpit or in the house where this church is meeting, and you're talking to him on the couch, and he begins to tell you something that's different from that which has been preached and revealed to, by God through his word, if that's the case, he, he is to be eternally condemned. That is how serious Paul took his preaching. I have the wrong passage on the next slide, but Colossians 2, 4 through 8 is where you'll find this passage, where Paul writes to the church at Colossae, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in the body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm you are and your, how firm your faith in Christ is. So then just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it, he says in verse 8, that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. How many people do we know in our lives that base their theology upon the things that Paul warns about here, that have replaced the truth of God's word, which is absolutely true for all people at all times in all cultures across the entire world, and have said, you know what? When I match it up to human tradition, the principles of this world, kind of what everybody else is saying in the world, it's just, you know, it seems a little old-fashioned. It seems a little outdated. It seems a little judgmental. It doesn't seem like it, it really speaks to the truth of the world in which we live in today. So I'm going to replace this with Oprah's book club, book of the month, and that's going to be my new thing. Or, you know, you, you name it, all right? I'm going to replace the truth of God with some new, hollow philosophy. Paul warns about that. To the Ephesian church, Paul wrote about the benefits of spiritual maturity. He says, listen, folks, he says, then you will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and the cunning of the craftiness of men and their, delight and their deceitful scheming. He was speaking about spiritual maturity. And as we spend time in God's word, as we are discipled properly, as we take a look at the historic faith and as we continue to grow, we recognize um, true teaching from false teaching. One more thing Paul said to his protege, Timothy, in 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, the Spirit clearly says, echoing what Jesus says here, in the later times that some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. What a word to use there. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. You know, a common denominator in every one of these passages is that false teachers are going to emerge from inside the church. These aren't people who, who come from outside of the church. One of the most powerful tools that Satan has at his disposal is wolves in sheep's clothing. These false teachers look like us, they sound like us, they dress like us, they speak like us, they use religious-sounding language, they attend lots of religious services, they, they blog about religious things, they write lots of books, and like I alluded to earlier, they even preach at some of the nation's largest churches and write some of the best-selling books on the Christian market. 
This is what Martin Luther Lloyd-Jones wrote about these people back again in the 1940s. The picture, he says, we need to have in our minds, therefore, should be this. The false prophet is a man who comes to us and who at first has the appearance of being everything that could be desired. He's nice and pleasing and pleasant. He appears to be thoroughly Christian, and he says all the right things. His teaching in general is quite all right, and he uses many terms that should be used and employed by a true Christian teacher. He talks about God. He seems to be saying everything that a Christian should say. He is obviously in sheep's clothing, and his way of living seems to correspond. So you do not suspect that there is anything wrong at all. There is nothing that at once attracts your attention or arouses your suspicions. Nothing glaringly wrong. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his classic work, The Cost of Discipleship, talked about this type of person when he said, there is someone standing by my side who looks just like a member of the church. He is a prophet and a preacher. He looks like a Christian. He talks and acts like one. But dark powers are mysteriously at work. It was those who sent him into our midst. He may even be unconscious himself of what he is doing. The devil can give him every encouragement and at the same time keeps him in the dark about his own motives. Hughes wrote, the result of such preacher's work is disastrous. Jesus says they are ferocious wolves, a horrific title. They are shepherds. They are a shepherd's and the shepherd's worst nightmare. They would destroy every sheep in the flock if undetected. If false preachers came into most evangelical churches as blatant heretics, they would be banged over the head with Bibles and sent packing. But when they come with the right language, with the right credentials and and culture, they deceive the unwary elect. So how are we to recognize false teaching when we come upon it? How do we distinguish between someone who's truly preaching the word of God and someone who's distorting it either intentionally or unintentionally? Well, we test the preachers and that which is taught. You know, this is something that the church at Berea was commended for. In Acts chapter 17, verse 10, Paul and Silas come to this little community called Berea. And they go to the Jewish synagogue, as was their tradition, and they begin to teach about Jesus, the Messiah. And the people are blown away by what Paul and Silas are saying. They've never heard teaching like this before. But because they've never heard teaching like this before, you know what the people in Berea did? Look at verse 11 of Acts 17. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Listen, we need to be like the Bereans. When I preach on Sunday mornings, you ought to be examining the scripture to see if what Brian said is true. When you're in a Bible study, You ought to be examining if what the speaker said was true or what the book that you're reading in your small group said jives with what Scripture says. You may be in a Bible study with somebody that you've been in three or four of those Bible studies before and everything seemed fine, and all of a sudden things seem a little bit different. Well, you know what? We need to check those things. Jesus told those listening to the Sermon on the Mount that we also can distinguish between a false teacher and a true messenger of the gospel By looking at the fruit in their lives, looking at the fruit that their lives and their teaching produces. Look at verses 16 through 20 of Matthew 7. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So let me give you some of the fruit that will help you recognize a false prophet or a false teacher. And I'm going to borrow these from Kent Hughes. Four doctrinal tests necessary for discerning false preachers. Number one, the false prophet avoids preaching on things such as holiness, righteousness, justice, and the wrath of God. In other words, this is a preacher who is quick to talk about God's love and God's grace, but not ever mention God's sin and his response to it. This is a pastor who doesn't want to point out the, that the life of a follower of Jesus Christ ought to look markedly different than the life of someone just living in society without a relationship with God. This is a pastor who is content to preach a theology that looks remarkably similar to the wide road that leads to destruction and not the narrow road that leads to life. 
Now, I know pastors today, friends of mine, colleagues in ministry, who refuse to preach about sin because they don't want to offend anyone. They say, hey, Brian, listen, people get beat up all week long in their jobs and they're stressed out at home. The last thing they want to do is come to church and hear about their sin and how they've got to change and repent and turn to God. And then they say, and how can I preach on sin when I'm a sinner myself? It's a horrific spot to be in. You know, there was a convention in 2004 here in the Twin Cities. It was the Emerging Church Convention of 2004. 1,400 people gathered here in the Twin Cities. And one of the speakers at that conference said that when a pastor preaches a sermon, it is an act of violence against the congregation. That was his view of, of preaching from the Word of God. Because he said, who is a pastor to tell people how they should live? And his approach to preaching is we should all sit around in a circle and discuss the gray areas that we happen to see in life and decide for ourselves what it is that, and how it is that we should live and address that in the society in which we live. And he's one of the most read pastors in the Christian church today who said that. It's a scary, scary deal. We need to be people who stand up for truth. Number two, the false preacher avoids preaching on the doctrine of final judgment. Earlier this year, Rob Bell, a very popular pastor, published a book entitled uh, Love Wins. And fun premise, basically the premise says that in the end, everybody gets to go to heaven and that God's going to, uh, we may experience hell for a little while, but in the end, even the, 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 the most person who is farthest from God will eventually be won over, and it may take them a million years in hell, but they're eventually going to be won over to heaven. Now, that's a very simplistic review of Rob's book. We've got a thorough review on our website if you'd like to read it. Francis Chan, though, has written a phenomenal book in response entitled Erasing Hell which debunks the current teaching that is so popular that it would strip the Bible of any reference to eternal punishment. You know, Jesus spoke more about hell in the Bible than he did heaven in the Bible. He did, uh, he, he, he talked so much about it and with such passion about it. It is a place that Christ would want no one to end up in, but it is a place that he allows people to go who would say that they would choose to ignore the grace and the love that he has to offer, who would seek to live their lives uh, apart from accepting Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Pastors who ignore this option do to the church at best an incredible disservice, and at worst will have culpability in the eternal destination of those who would never heard the true story because of uh, their insistence on preaching something that isn't true. There are two cults today, two of the largest cults in America, the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, that reject the doctrine of hell. They've whitewashed hell and replaced it with a less offensive doctrine, and there is no doubt that that is one of the reasons that both of those groups are growing as fast as they are. Because there's something incredibly appealing to being able to live life however you want to live it without any consequences. Number three, false prophets fail to emphasize the fallenness and the depravity of mankind. They begin basically with the premise that man is good. This kind of teaching is diametrically opposed to what Christ says at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Remember? A failure to recognize our spiritual poverty and our total depravity apart from the grace of God means that we cannot enter the kingdom of God. Number four, false prophets de-emphasize the substitutionary death and the atonement of Christ. Some of these pastors are people who say things like, um, well, the cross is just such a brutal symbol from a time so long ago. Now, how can we talk about the cross in modern society? It's just too graphic for, for children. And the idea that Christ went to the cross to suffer for our sins, I mean, that's just depressing. And it makes, it, it, it too, uh, makes us too, too culpable in his death. And it's just a little too dramatic. And many of these pastors would choose just not to talk about the cross whatsoever. Yeah, Hughes gave an incredible example of this. There's, there's a, a hymn that many sing at Easter time called In the Cross of Christ Thy Glory. It is a beautiful hymn. But it was written by a guy named Sir John Bowring, who was an English Unitarian and Utilitarian and wasn't a believer whatsoever in the atonement of Jesus Christ. The words all said that he believed that. I would have no problem singing the words of that hymn today in church. But the guy who wrote it didn't know anything of the atonement. You see, false prophets talk about God, they wax eloquent about Jesus, and even talk about his death on the cross. And many don't see them as heretics. 
Hughes writes, they are likable, truly nice people, pleasant to be around. Sometimes churches grow under their ministries, but the following years are tragic, bringing a sea of unbelieving children and empty pews. So how important is truth to you? Is truth worth fighting for? Is truth worth defending anymore? Or is it just too hard? Is it just too hard to stand for truth in our pluralistic society? Jesus referred to himself as the way, the truth, and the life. If we want to be a discerner of truth, then we need to go to the source of truth, God's word. The Bible is our source. The more you're in it, the more you will recognize false doctrine when you hear it. The more you're in the word, the more apparent it will be that when you are reading false doctrine, that that's exactly what's being served up to you. And so many of today's best-selling Christian books and, uh, are, are the exact opposite of what the Bible teaches. You know, our denomination is uh, called the Conservative Congregational Christian Conference. And 60-some years ago, this denomination started because there was a battle for the Bible in the traditional congregational churches of that day. And there was a battle that said, you know what, maybe this book really isn't the inspired word of God. Maybe it was just a collection of sayings that men gave over the years. Maybe, you know what, it, it's, it's outdated. Maybe it's, uh, you know, good for teaching some stuff. Maybe we just teach the red letter stuff of Jesus and ignore the rest of it. Maybe, you know, that's how we, we handle scripture. And the people that day said, uh, who, who started our fellowship of churches said, no, we're not going there. We're not going there. Because the Bible is the inspired, infallible word of God. And when we check this one out, and when we say this is no longer important, well, then we have ceased to recognize truth. MacArthur writes this, Controversy and conflict in the church are never to be relished or engaged in without sufficient cause. But in every generation, every generation, the battle for truth has proved ultimately unavoidable because the enemies of truth are relentless. Truth is always under assault, and it is actually a sin not to fight when vital truths are under attack. That is true even though fighting sometimes results in conflict within the visible community of professing Christians. In fact, whether the enemies of gospel truth succeed in infiltrating the church, faithful believers are obliged to take the battle to them even there. That is certainly the case today as it has been since apostolic times. That's why 60 years ago, when the churches began to preach that maybe this isn't the word of God, that generation of Christians said, no, we're going to stand up for the truth. And we're going to come out from amongst them. In, in his book, The Truth War, again, which I recommend you read, MacArthur spends 30 pages in his appendix talking about why discernment is out of fashion today. And in a few minutes, I want to share with you what he says. Number one, truth is, uh, discernment is out of, fashion today, out of fashion today because of the exposure to more religious ideas than at any point in history. MacArthur told the story about shopping in a rural Arkansas town. He was driving through Arkansas to preach at a conference. He was with another pastor, and he saw this house that said quilts for sale. And he said, hey, I want to go because it's our, my wife's been wanting a quilt. Our anniversary's coming up. So they stopped by this little home where this woman had a quilt business that she ran out of the house. And as McCarthy went to the door of that house, he saw um, uh, the husband of the wife there watching some Christian television show on TV. And being a pastor, he kind of scanned the books in the room, and he noticed a lot of great books by evangelical people but sprinkled in between those books were a number of other books. Books by, um, the Book of Mormon was there, and there were books by um, New Age authors, and there were books by uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses. He was reading a Watchtower magazine. And so uh, MacArthur said, let me ask you something. He says, are you a believer? And the guy says, well, sure, sure, I'm a believer. And then um, he said, well, you know, these books that you've got, they, they all represent different religious beliefs. Do, do you accept any one of them? And the guy looked at him and he says, well, I find there's good in all of it. I just read it and look for the good in, in the books. And MacArthur said, like his wife's quilt, the man had patched together his faith, picking and choosing that which he liked from different religions. In a sense, this man had created God in his own image and was on the wide road that leads to destruction. But you know, I know so many Christians like this man. They want uh, to take what they like out of Christianity and then they'll dabble in some Eastern mysticism and some horoscopes and they'll spend a great amount of time reading the New Age teachings of whatever their book club is studying this month and they do it all under the guise of trying to understand the world. And oftentimes don't even realize how much of the mindset of the authors that they are adopting is their own. Okay, number two, 
Discernment is out of fashion because of the rise of extreme tolerance. Our children are taught from about the time they uh, enter school that tolerance is the highest of ideals, that that's what love is, tolerating any and all viewpoints. But tolerating that which isn't true and calling that which is false true isn't love. MacArthur writes, anyone who cites religious beliefs as a reason to reject another person's way of life is automatically viewed with the same contempt that used to be reserved for out-and-out religious heretics. The culture around us has declared war on biblical standards. Some Christians unwittingly began, some Christians unwittingly began following suit several years ago. That has opened the door for a whole generation in the church to embrace postmodern relativism openly and deliberately. They don't want the truth presented with stark black and white clarity anymore. They prefer having issues of right and wrong, true and false, good and bad, deliberately painted in shades of gray. We have reached a point where the typical churchgoer today assumes that 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 is the proper way of understanding truth. Any degree of certainty has begun to sound offensive to people's postmodernized ears. Number three, a refusal to shun the world. I said it last week, and I'll say it again, that we have come to the point in the church of Jesus Christ where so many of us say, I want enough of Jesus to get me into heaven, but enough of the world to keep life interesting. I want enough of the world so that I don't look like a freak. I want enough of the world so that when people see me, they, they see somebody who looks a lot like them, and, and that my life won't be offensive to, to anyone around me. And we have forgotten that God has called us as Christians to live, in the words of Peter, as aliens and strangers in this world. Discernment goes out the window when we spend our days entertaining ourselves at the world's buffet and ignoring all that God wants us to feast on. Number four, a failure to interpret Scripture properly. We as a church so often spend so little time in God's Word that we don't recognize when Scripture is interpreted correctly and when a teacher is distorting God's Word to drive home his or her point. A few years ago, one of my best friends was part of a search committee at his church where they were calling a senior pastor. And they had all these standards they were looking for in a senior pastor. And this one candidate came and he was winsome and he was funny and uh, boy, he could tell a great joke and he could entertain the congregation and he kind of wooed the congregation to calling him as their senior pastor. And within three months, uh, this guy had completely split the church. One of the questions that was asked to him when he was candidating though was, so how do you prepare for a sermon? How do you, how do you, you know, study? What, what role does hermeneutics have, that science of interpreting Scripture in your life? And the guy said, oh, he says, I just kind of read it and put down what I'm thinking. He says, I don't pay any attention to those commentators. I can care less what the history of the church is. God's going to reveal to me what he wants me to preach to my flock. Anytime you have somebody who's teaching you that doesn't want to take the time to study and doesn't want to take the time to rightly divide the word of truth, what Paul told Timothy to do, in 2 Timothy, then we've got some major issues. Not only did the guy divide the church, but a year later he was arrested, leading uh, be, um, uh, that church to, to completely fall apart. Number five, the neglect of church discipline. And, you know, sometimes when you say that, people have the wrong picture. But when it comes to dealing with sin in the church, very few churches take Jesus' instructions in Matthew 18 seriously. When a brother or sister in Christ is actively living a life of sin, it's our responsibility as brothers and sisters in Christ to lovingly confront that sin, not to be a judgmental jerk, not to pretend that we've got it all together, but to care enough that we lovingly confront. We don't just look the other way when someone that we love is actively pursuing a life of sin. And number six, a lack of spiritual maturity. I, I read, I've read the statistics on multiple occasions, including last week, on how far the church has strayed from the traditional doctrines of the Christian faith. The church is at a point of crisis when it comes to her level of spiritual maturity. MacArthur writes, the brand of Christianity prevalent in this generation may be shallower than at any time in history. It's a shocking indictment on the church. So what's the solution? I love what MacArthur says here. He says, the path to discernment is the way of spiritual maturity. And, on, and the only means to spiritual maturity is mastery of the Word of God. How much time are you spending in His Word? I'll be honest. In the past week, the last seven days, from the last Sunday when you were here, if you were here to this Sunday, how much time have you spent in God's Word on your own? Apart from a small group, apart from, you know, a class that you've got to teach, apart from anything else, how much time have you spent diving in 
to his word. Because you will fall prey to any wind of doctrine if you don't know this. Just yesterday I was in uh, Rose City, Minnesota. The population of Rose City is 32 people. If you want to know what quiet is, go to Rose City and open the door. I mean, it is just absolutely silent. My aunt and uncle live there now. And I had a time with the Lord that was so sweet. Kind of went away from what I normally do for devotions and, and uh, just wanted to kind of read the Sermon on the Move. You know, what happens after Matthew 7? So starting at Matthew 8 and reading through the rest of Matthew. And in one sitting, just had this beautiful time seeing Jesus living out the principles that he taught in Matthew 5 through 7. And it was one of the sweetest times that I've had with God in a long time. Earlier this week, I was at, at um, the Stillwater Library, which has become like a sanctuary to me. Nobody knows me when I go to the Stillwater Library. You have this beautiful view of the St. Croix River, and I can just spend time and study and be in God's Word. We all need places like that that we can just get away. And we prioritize other things in our life. Are we prioritizing that time with God? Are we letting him speak to us in the silent moments? Are we letting his word do what his word needs to do in our life? Somebody once asked, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you of the crime? It's really a question that Jesus addressed in verse 20. Thus by their fruit you will recognize them. Deception in the church will ultimately be recognized by the fruit of which that deceiver produces in their life. Genuine disciples are also recognized by their fruit. What's the fruit in your life? Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit, is that evidence in your life? Is your, fruit, is, is your life uh, pointing people to Jesus Christ? When people see you, do they see Christ in you? I want to close with a great story I read this week. So in 1952, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to an extraordinary man. And reporters and city officials gathered at a Chicago radio, railroad station one afternoon in 1953 to welcome that 1952 Nobel Peace Prize winner to their city. A few minutes after the train came to a stop, a giant of a man, six foot four inches tall with bushy hair and a large mustache, stepped off that train. Cameras flashed and city officials wanted to get close to the man who'd won the Nobel Peace Prize. Various people began telling him how honored they were to meet him. They were making a huge deal of this man. The man politely thanked him and then looking over their heads like a six foot four guy can do, he asked if he could be excused for a moment. And he quickly walked through the crowd until he reached an elderly African American woman who was struggling with two large suitcases. And he picked up her bags and he said with a smile, um, how can I help you? And he escorted her to the bus. And after helping her aboard, she wished, he wished her a safe journey. And then he returned to his greeting party and he apologized and said, sorry to have kept you waiting. The man was Dr. Albert Schweitzer, the famous missionary doctor who had spent his life helping the poor in Africa. And in response to Schweitzer's action, one member of the reception committee said with great admiration to the reporter that was standing next to him, that's the first time I ever saw a sermon walking. <laughs> it's beautiful. May we as people, followers of Jesus Christ, representatives of the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, the one who said, no one can come to the Father except through me. May we be bold enough to share that message with the world. May we be loving enough to be people who, when we share that message with the world, that they will hear it and see it because of the way that we live. May we be walking sermons, teaching the truth of God wherever we go. Let's pray. Father, it's been a heavy topic today. But Lord, you wouldn't have put this topic in the Bible if you didn't want us to talk about it. And Lord, when we look around at our world today, we see many who have followed hollow and deceptive philosophies that are religions and ways of life that are based upon anything uh, but you. We've substituted the truth of the gospel for the philosophies of the world. And Lord, even as your church, we spend so much more time entertaining ourselves whether it be through sports or television shows or parties or friends or through the significance that we think that we can receive at work and so many other things, and we spend so little time with you when we think about it. And Lord, may you help us to be people who truly know what it means to live with you as our Lord and Savior. May we truly be people 
who put you first and honor you in everything we do. May we truly be people who seek the truth of the word that is revealed still today in Scripture. Lord, you've given us everything that we need to know to live for you in this generation. Give us the courage to do it. And Lord, as we speak the truth, may we do it in love, not as jerks. Lord, you absolutely love even those who are false prophets. You warned them of the danger, but you died for them too. God, help us not to be afraid to stand for truth, to call those who are distorting your truth back to Orthodox Christianity. God, may we in our generation just reflect you in everything we do and say. Give us a burden and a hunger for you like we've never had before. In Jesus' name, amen.